everybody. Welcome to episode seven. I think this is episode seven of the Limelight Podcast. I'm Maddie. We're here with Dr. Sloan. I'm not sure which side of the video it's going to put me on, so you might be on either side of me. Um, but yeah, hi, Dr. Sloan. Hi, Maddie. How are you? Good. Um, okay. This is going to be our special Candida episode. We get tons and tons of questions about Candida all the time, and it often is a um, compounding issue with a lot of Lyme and other illnesses. So we're going to take this whole episode to just answer some questions and Dr. Sloan is going to unload his very vast store of knowledge on Candida um, to help all of us kind of understand the topic a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's jump right into it. I would like to know what is Candida? Candida um, is the great nemesis of the 20th century. It really is such a problem in our society because of um, the sugar and the antibiotics that we have available to us that over the years of treating patients, it's been kind of hard to test. So the easiest thing to do is start to treat it right up front. So everybody knows that I have a big, uh, a big issue with candida. It creates our largest histamine reactions. It causes um, inflammatory states from head to toe. And for most patients, it doesn't, it doesn't leave the gut, but it grows on the lining of the gut and it emits all the, I call it the metabolic waste, the poop and the pee and all the materials that it, it creates. And then it makes us toxic in our cells. Um, even cancer cells look like a fungus, cancer cells look like a parasite. Candida is considered parasitic because it lives off the human body and it lives off our glucose that we consume in our day. So I, I consider it the great nemesis of the 20th century. However, it's really easy to get rid of for the most part. I say that and I mean it with respect because some people are going to say, oh my gosh, you couldn't fix mine or I'm the worst one ever. But there are mul multiple facets to it. There's over 300,000 species of candida. Wow. And like my generation, we were like uh, the first really purely antibiotic generation. So I, any sniffle, we were running off to the doctor. I, I was very sick when I grew up with, I, I took antibiotic combinations that are completely off the market at this point. But so Stacy and I, she's sitting here next to me, um, grew up on, well, not you so much, but because your family was different, but a lot of antibiotics. So our, our gut was riddled with it. So mm -hmm. the babies that we had literally are born with candida these days. So the, the reaction that, that our GI is supposed to have of kind of like 80% good guys um, and 20% mixed guys, mm -hmm. the guys control the bad guys, um, just doesn't really exist anymore. So we have a, a very, very sick population born with candida and they never really established good gut health. Right. And we know the gut health is the key to everything. I have many, many Lyme patients that are very positive, but have no symptoms, but they've had really good GI health. Yeah. So there's a, there's a triad that, that comes with it. So it's a, it's a big deal for, for us. We start all our patients on some kind of antifungal at the beginning. Well, I've noticed that to be true for myself. Um, Cause you know, I was super sick got better, kind of had remission. And, you know, in that time started to research and learn more about healing and trying to get myself better. And that's when I started really getting into gut health and nerding out about that. Um, and I definitely, the, the healthier I built my gut and the healthier I started eating. And when I started figuring out which foods I agreed with and didn't agree with and started doing things like probiotics and, um, you know, and then as I got healthier, I could start doing fermented foods and doing right. all of that stuff, um, you know, my symptoms decrease. Sure, sure. Because it's a histamine issue. Right. When you walk into my door, I'm going to start up front. It doesn't matter if you have cancer, Lyme disease, or headaches, or toe pain. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start with antifungals and food allergies because we're trying to lower your histamine levels so we can have the best um, overall response and start healing the gut. Candida causes so many issues with 
my patients up front that once I treat them with antifungals, usually before I even see them again for their follow-ups, they're feeling better already. Right. And then one of the biggest things is that, and we need to discuss this a little bit further. I'm going to get really excited about this topic, but Candida causes more global brain fog than Lyme disease. Yeah. A I, I remember global brain fog and specific neurological disease. Well, I remember. So if you have global brain fog, like a, just a general malaise, fogginess feeling versus specific neurological issues, the global is generally candida and the specific is Lyme, if that's what you're dealing with? Yeah, I, I would say so. Through my experience, and that's a lot of experience, because um, when a spirochete attacks a specific part of the brain, it causes a demyelization or an ischemic area or a plaque buildup mm -hmm. or biofilm, then you get a specific neurocondition, like your foot starts to drop. You look like you had MS symptoms, even almost overnight. Um, you get tinglys, buzzes, and specific neuro symptoms. With candida, it causes a global brain fog because candida lives in the gut and it poops and peeps all this metabolic waste. And the metabolic waste, when it gets into your brain, is a neurotransmitter mimicker. So Interesting. So it looks like a serotonin or a dope or a norepinephrine, epinephrine, catecholamine system. And so then you have that thought or that response or you want to say something or you want to have a behavior and that does not fit and it doesn't express information. So then you have a false mimicker. So it gives you... But it can give you a global brain fog that creates such a condition that you literally feel depersonalized. So I'm not gonna, mm -hmm. I'm not going to make it sound like it's a walk in the park, but you can feel like, I mean, you can feel so depersonalized that you feel out of body, you don't feel present, you don't feel like you're in the conversation. Um, it's a it's a really big deal, but it's so much easier to treat than than Lyme disease and viruses and things like this is so much easier to chase down. Well, I think what's so interesting is, um, you know, especially with my generation and now, you know, my generation is being probably born with too much candida or two generations ago born with candida. So we really don't have much hope. Um, and you know, my generation is just rife with mental illness, depression, anxiety, um, you know, and, and depersonalization. A lot of times if you talk to people my age who struggle with mental illness, a lot of it is like social anxiety because they have, they're having that depersonalization and that like mm -hmm. non-present feeling. And what's so sad is that a lot of these people are on SSRIs or, you know, benzos or whatever to try to deal with this horrible feeling that they have or this social anxiety. But it really is Probably in a lot of people, it's gut imbalance and candida. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm nearing my late 40s, almost 50. And when we grew up, there was no such thing as us feeling depressed, anxious, having testing anxiety, feeling social anxiety. It, either it wasn't called out, it wasn't named, um, or it wasn't there. Right. And now it's just, it's just rampant. I don't, I don't talk to many. And I don't really remember, you know, growing up, everything was all fine and great. And me and all my friends were all fine and great. But now, even if you talk to the generation below me, um, you know, kids that are my brother's age that are now, you know, starting college or even kids now that are in high school, there's just this huge, and I do think part of it is, you know, the world we live in, social media, all that stuff. Um, right. But, you know, there's just this culture of like extreme social anxiety that so many people have. And I don't think anyone's really talking about the gut connection to that, which is so important. And we get there sometimes, like sometimes the gut, someone will write a book and everyone will get really excited about gut health for like six months and then they forget about it. Gosh, I should have written that book 20 years ago because <laughs> you I, have. Well, I'm so, I'm so mad. I, I have... Um, a candida diet on one page I wrote out 20 years ago, and it's still the candida diet today that is still used. 
It could um, be the Dr. Sloan Candida diet. It, but it's such a bad book because it's like one page. Right. Um, it's simple. But <laughs> so inside your gut, inside the intestine, you make 90% of the neurotransmitters that run your brain. Right. So here you are talking about this. And yeah, there's a relationship between that. Um, in the past, I've worked with a lot of autistic kids and I can prove that we can cut the nerves from your brain to your gut and your gut will live, but other way around and your brain won't. It, it needs everything it needs from your gut to run your brain. So once you get an imbalanced GI, Candida, imagine inside the small intestine, which is a microvilli, it's like a little tiny hair that flips around in there. And if you stretch it out, it has a surface area of a tennis court. Mm -hmm. Rather large in one single human body. And there is some kind of microbe growing on the entire surface area. So these microbes grow in big colonies like a culture. And they start disrupting the way you process your amino acids from your proteins and all your amino acids from your proteins become neurotransmitters like 5-HTP from meat becomes serotonin, tryptophan or, or the precursors become dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, I said already, um, it, the catecholamine system, everything comes from amino acids. So when you have an impaired gut, so if anybody's even bloated, <laughs> if you're puffy, like you feel like you're, you know, if you have a transition of redness from your palm to your fingertips, then you're going to see a high histamine. Okay. So it, 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 it <laughs> <laughs> the higher the histamine, histamine by itself is an interesting molecule because your brain loves histamine. Your cells don't. Interesting. Yeah. So if you take too many antihistamines, then you decrease your histamine and your brain will tell your mast cells to be, make more histamine. So your brain can feed off that fuel. So too much histamine is a brain on fire. Too little histamine is a brain that doesn't have any fire. So there's a balance. We always have the histamine rations. But candida is, is a nemesis in the, and, and I'm, I'm putting it together and I think other people have too that for our patients with neurodegenerative diseases, or if they have a lot of mast cell reactions, that we're trying to trying to understand what's happening in the brain and what's giving them neurological diseases. And we talked about this earlier, and you and I talk about a lot of fun stuff. We should probably record everything. We should record all of our conversations. And so we're looking in the brain to try to figure out what's causing a neurodegenerative condition or it's causing somebody to feel like they have Lyme brain. Well, it doesn't have to be the bacteria of Borrelia burgdorferi or Bartonella or Babesia. It can be viruses and it can be funguses. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until last January that a study came out where they injected lab rats with appropriate doses of Candida albicans. And then they, poor rats, they studied the rat brains and they realized that candida can get through the the um, the CSF into the into the brain and cause um, and cause the same neurological immune reactions that Borrelia causes and that Epstein Barr causes or other viruses cause. Interesting, and you know you're pretty much would you say guaranteed to have a problem with candida if you're fighting you know, if you're immune compromised because of something like Lyme or Epstein-Barr or Bartonella or anything like that? But like this, how about you're guaranteed to have candida if you haven't been properly treated these days? Okay. Fair Second, enough. <laughs> if you're puffy, stuffy and have bad gut, you have candida. Right. Uh, which candida puts the holes in your gut because like I said, since it can get through the brain, what's that thing called? It can get through the brain, then it causes... It has a spirochetal end. So that's what screws into the intestinal tract and releases as an adult and causes the holes. So that's right. what causes your food sensitivities. So chase down your food sensitivities, please. So do a food allergy test, food sensitivity test every year and it's gonna to change to whatever you're eating, you're gonna be sensitive to that because you haven't dealt with candida. Right, right. And you're just gonna be chasing rabbits. If you don't treat candida properly, you're gonna be 
you're going to be chasing rabbits. So I can, I can promise you that the majority of um, Lyme docs, um, even the most well-known doctors, and I've spoken to them, especially recently, there's a lot of your most famous docs that have treated Lyme for 20 years that are calling asking about SOT now. It's getting, it's getting a lot of good attention because of people are talking about it. Because it's cool. It's cool. So it, it, if you're not treating candida, then you're not going to have success with other things. I can't imagine why it would be even common sense from any ILADS doc or IDS doc to, or functional medicine doc, he's trying to treat Lyme, to give somebody antibiotics years after years without giving them antifungals the whole time because right. you're going to need antibiotics sick and full of candida and candida is going to make the same symptoms you have for Lyme. Right. And then well, and that's probably what happened to me because I don't think, um, I don't think I was ever on an antifungal, maybe for like a month. Um, but I don't think I was ever really on an antifungal for a long period of time. And like with really the intention of getting rid of candida, healing my gut until I saw you. And that was after I was on antibiotics for years. So, you know, I was having all these symptoms that were still really persistent and sure. it, it really, and you know, like I, I didn't know for sure. Cause I didn't have, you know, I was still testing positive, but I didn't have Lyme symptoms and I could differentiate between how I felt with Lyme, but I still just had a lot of other issues, a lot of gut problems, a lot of food mm -hmm. allergies. Um, and now that I'm, you know, I've, I've taken care of that. I mean, obviously SOT has been extremely helpful. Um, but now I eat better because I have that knowledge of how to feed myself to maintain my gut lining. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel, how do you feel in the past is a difference from your, your Lyme symptoms and then feeling like a, a candida thing. Can you tell now, like if your candida flares? Um, well, I definitely do. I mean, histamine is still always an issue for me. Um, and it's not as bad. Um, you know, the Lyme things, you know, so here's a specific example. I used to have really bad um, nerve pain and I like down my legs, I would get nerve pain. Um, and after, and honestly, I didn't realize it was even happening anymore because I'd had it for so many years. And after the SOT, it went away. And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know that it could feel like this. It was awesome. Um, so that was like a specific Lyme thing. And I haven't had that now since SOT, but I still do get, um, you know, if I eat gluten, um, if I, kombucha doesn't really agree with me, I'll get bloated um, and I'll get tired. And, yeah. you know, and I had wine yesterday. Wine does not agree with me. And it's probably because I have some fungal imbalance, but it just makes me feel tired and bleh. Oh, but if you drink enough, it may be worth it. <laughs> That's true. That's why I only drink like once a year and I have to go crazy because then I'm sick for like five days. And I just have to make it worth it the one time. Yeah, when you, when you drink things that have yeast in them or that have high sugar content, it can be pretty immediate. Um, you, you know, red, red nose, red ear tips, um, increasing hand uh, redness, it redness. all relates to, to high histamine. I will say, um, what has been really interesting is I used to have zero sugar tolerance. This is probably a better indicator than the wine or the gluten, because that I don't agree with anyway. Um, but I used to not have any sugar tolerance and I probably was sugar free. I was sugar free for several years and just avoided sugar probably for like five years. Um, did stevia everything, did not consume any sugar, didn't even eat that much fruit. And now mm. I'm a sugar fiend and I eat candy all the time and I eat tons of fruit and I put sugar in my coffee and I feel fine. I feel fine. Whereas before, um, if I did a lot of sugar, it would make me, right. you know, I'd peak and then crash. I'd be really tired. I would get puffy. Do you know why? Probably because I was feeding the candida. You were, and candida loves sugar. I so love sugar too. The sugar goes high, the insulin goes up, it drops your glucose. The, the candida eats the, eats the sugar and then it plummets you to a, a valley. And that's where a patient ends up with something called syndrome X. Syndrome X is 
is the high glucose, low hypoglycemic states that you go through while the candida eats up that glucose molecule before it actually gets so desensitized inside the cell that you end up with diabetes. So we always see, we always see normal glucose, syndrome X, peaks and valleys, and then the patient developing high hemoglobin A1C levels because they start to develop diabetes. But I don't have a diabetic patient that doesn't have candida albicans. And we, we like to check, and this is a, this is a misnomer for physicians um, and patients, please know this. If they check you for candida antibodies, which is a candida IgM, IgG, and IgA antibody, and they're negative, it doesn't mean you don't have gut candida pooping and peeing this waste all over your body and poisoning your brain. That just means that the candida hasn't left the intestinal wall and gotten into the bloodstream to create what's called a true candidiasis. Mm. So true candidiasis, which I had today on a 32 year old patient, and it's easy to treat, but you can't rely on just the blood antibiotic test to know if you have a candida issue. But right. so many of these, these docs who are taking a couple of classes on functional medicine will test a candida antibody and decide that it's, you know, it's not worth treating. Um, and I'm going to tell you, if you don't treat it up front, if you don't treat it the whole time you're treating other things, then you're going to really be fooled because it'll catch you on the backside. It may right. look good up front. Um, if my patients don't stay on some type of antifungals, um, which the antifungals that we need to use are called um, fatty acid antifungals. There's prescription and non-prescription fatty acid antifungals, but we need the ones that don't leave the intestine. So you clean the whole 30 feet of the tube. If a doc's giving you some random diflucan every now and then, you're not going to treat the whole intestine because you're taking a, a systemic antifungal as well as some of the other antifungals that are food-based. They only make it down the intestine a certain distance and then they're metabolized out. Right. So they don't get all the way down that tube. It's, um, it's something that you have to take care of through the whole intestine. I'm probably teaching some other physicians in this video, but that's okay. <laughs> um, well, okay. I have so many questions, and I, but I want to make this flow so it makes sense for everyone. Um, I guess what, well, let's talk about for a second, what are some symptoms of candida that maybe are surprising that some people, like if people are struggling with X symptom, what are a lot of things where you see people come in, they think it's something, and it turns out it's candida? How about like almost everything? So if, 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 if a patient has studied this problem, let's say it's Lyme, um, and that's all they know, they're not going to even look at the candida stuff. Right. It, it's a trifecta that I must cover. So if you're bloated, it's the number one sign that inside your intestinal tract, inside the tube, mast cells are reacting to candida and you're creating a histamine response and that histamine lets, is, is released in the mast cell, then it hits the wall and then you have this intestinal bloating. It could be diarrhea because candida wants to purge. It gives you mushy poop. Um, it could be constipation because it, it tightens the wall of the gut and creates a, a gastroparesis condition where the gut muscle can't contract. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the first one. If you have unusual sugar cravings, oh, here's a good one. Let's say you eat a really good healthy meal and you feel full and you feel satisfied. And then and you, you have a sugar full, craving. And you still want something else. Yeah. That's candida going. I need the sugar. Give me any glucose. I need some, yeah, I need some sugar. Interesting. Um, well, and, you know, it's making me think, and you know, I haven't really thought about this that much and put two and two together. But when I first started seeing you, um, I was hypothyroid and I had gained a bunch of weight. I'd gained like 25 pounds, like out of the blue. And I could not, I was starving myself. I was working out constantly. Um, you know, I eventually I went keto for a while and I could not lose weight. And now I eat whatever, everything's fine. And I have a, like a, a homeostasis where I don't really, my weight doesn't really fluctuate, but yeah. it probably was because of inflammation from candida from being on antibiotics for so long, not addressing the candida. And I just had this inflammation. And every time I did eat sugar, 
I was having like a weird insulin response. Yeah, good point. I've had patients lose 10, 15 pounds of water, 20 pounds of water in just the first month, six weeks that we get rid of candida because that histamine um, makes that, that fluid stick into the muscles. And there's another thing, if you have fibromyalgia, if you have joint inflammation, if you have eczema, or acne. acne, asthma, they're all histamine related issues. They're not, they're not necessarily inflammation on that tissue, but it's the histamine that's released through the body that causes those reactions. Um, chalky coating on your tongue, of course, the brain fog, you know, we talked okay. about global, global brain fog. I can tell you that I know when my histamine is high, especially like I go away for a week and I'm eating more sugar. Um, I get foggy. I get achy. <clears throat> um, I just, I feel a little bit depersonalized. I don't feel like I'm present. Yeah. I can definitely feel those things, but I'm a little bit hypersensitive <laughs> to things. So yeah, what else? I mean, it's fluid leaking out of your ears. Like if you get wet, fluidy ears, if your ears crackle when you swallow, um, if you have that itch in your ears that you never can reach, it's candida. Ew. I don't Ew. want candida in my ears. It grows on any mucous membrane or any orifice in the human body. That's nasty. That's disgusting. I haven't had itchy ears in a long time, so hopefully we're okay with that. I did get itchy ears when I had mine. It's probably candida. Probably so. Um, what else did I want to ask you? Okay, so treating candida, what do you do? <clears throat> the the best treatment is to take fatty acids that don't absorb through the gut and out into the system. Most of the Lyme docs that are medicine docs are going to use some Daflucan or some Ketoconazole, which is the Daflucan is fluconazole and there's Ketoconazole. They're all azoles. They they metabolize out through the gut into the whole body. So they don't really take care of it in the whole gut. So they just give it this every now and then and they just keep it on a loop um, with me. And I really enjoy setting foundations up front so that I'm not chasing rabbits every time I see you. I'm not gonna try something new. Every time you come in, I'm gonna set my foundations. We're gonna clean candida, we're gonna clean your gut. We're gonna do proper Lyme testing. And the the, Lyme testing these days is having some, some good positive changes in the future. Um, diet is important. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to, we're going to see that we can, we can make these changes. So the, um, if you look at the back of an MCT oil, it's full of caprylates. Mm -hmm. caprylic acid. So caprylic acid is a fatty acid. Um, just like the, there's a prescription antifungal that we use that's a natural fatty acid, even though it's a prescription, please know that it's mostly natural. And then, um, grapefruit seed extract is really good too. And there's mm. others, a whole lot of others. And people are going to want to know about all the other stuff, but I'm telling you the ones that work because I've been testing poop for 18 years and we can eat a will finally culture in a dish outside your body, which it only, it, about 50% of the time, candida will not culture outside the body, so you can't test it. So if you get a negative candida culture in a poop, it doesn't mean that you don't have it. It just means mm -hmm. it's culture. Um, so when it does culture and we test it, those fatty acids work every time, every, every, every time. So, so this is, you know, taking MCT oil is very anti-candida. And then diet wise, eliminating. So I'm assuming that an antihistamine diet would be very similar to an anti candida diet. It's, it is. So yeah. you're trying to eliminate sugars, refined sugars. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of easier to say what you can eat. Right. So eat proteins, vegetables, and a lot of healthy fats. Right. Food, and, just, you know, food. <laughs> and if you eat fruit, it has to be the berry families and it needs to be um needs to be not a large amount because even a couple of blueberries is like 22 grams of sugar so it's the same either way right we call it the three-step program we got to kill the bad guy 
we got to remove it off the lining of the gut. We got to, after that, we want to heal the damage that it caused to that surface area. And we use immunoglobulins and glutamine, DGL. Um, um, there's some other mucolytics. And then we use, they put back in the good bacteria, and then you got your three cell gut healing protocol. And it's not, it's not magic. It just has to be done. Right. And, you know, to people, I know that, you know, diet can be a touchy topic for a lot of people. Um, but I'm a great example. You don't have to do it forever. I did, you know, I've had a very strict diet for probably eight or nine years. Um, but now I, I mean, I still eat healthy because I know how bad the stuff is to, I don't want to poison myself. Right. Now I have the knowledge. Um, but you know, now I can pretty much eat whatever. And you know, I had three pieces of pizza from the pizza place the other day and I felt fine. Am I going to do that every day because I felt fine that one time? Absolutely not. Cause I know it'll kill me, but I used to not even be able to touch gluten without having a histamine response. So, so you have a good gut. We've taken care of candida. You've healed the lining and you put back in the good bacteria. And now you're restored. Like you should have been from, from the baby. Right. Um, Babies have no bacteria in their GI at all until they go through the vaginal canal. And that's where they suck in some good bacteria. And most of that should be like a bacillus. But, you know, in this day, most of us can do that. So they're just born that way. So you've reestablished your gut health. And that makes a big difference. And it, it will last you a lifetime. Hopefully. That was really, you know, I, I do think probably 50% of the negative symptoms that I experienced during and post Lyme were probably due to all the antibiotics I was on. Sure. Yeah. I definitely, you know, cause I, I mean, I got to a point where I just stopped taking them and, you know, I, I went off of them earlier than I was supposed to because I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I was feeling so sick. I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And you know, I didn't get better, but I didn't get worse. And I was at least able to eat and you know, nourish myself and kind of start putting the building blocks back together. The antibiotics were rough, man. My mother was just telling me before we started this podcast, and I told her it's about candida. She said, well, you healed me of candida? And I'm like, what? And it was like in 2000, and I'm starting practice, and we were really following a book about um, how to get rid of candida with food alone. So I put her on this diet and it, and it really improved her health. She said like four or five weeks, she felt so much better. Yeah. As we found out over time that candida will still find its carb to live off, even if it breaks down your muscle to live off the carb. Wow. It's a pathogen. It's parasitic, even though it's fungal. And it will find its carbohydrate. So you can't kill it by diet alone. So you Interesting. have to adjunctive fatty acids. So does that mean that if, for example, if you did have candida and you went on a keto diet to try to mitigate symptoms of candida, whether you knew that you had it or you didn't, if you weren't having success on that diet, could it be because the candida is cannibalizing your body to get the glucose? Well, you're going to have a heck of a die-off reaction. So the keto flu is what I consider candida die-off reaction. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You, it's so much easier for us to use antifungals and then start keto kind of at a transition at the same time. Because right. Because you're going to be a bear. You got a lot of discipline if you can get rid of a high candida count through diet alone. So my cancer patients, we force them into keto. Oh my gosh, if I didn't have them on antifungals, it would be nearly impossible. The, the connection of... of what grows in your gut makes your brain crave food. Your brain doesn't crave a single thing. It's neoplastic. So it's not craving anything. It's your bugs in your GI that tell your brain what it needs to eat. Right. So a connection of these days with food and the sugar, and I can't get off my sugar. It gives me, it makes me feel better. Um, gives me that, that little rise in dopamine. It's really definitely a, a chemical addiction it's the candida being like feed me feed me <laughs> i want the sugar um all right 
I think we're running up on about half an hour. So I kind of just want to summarize what we talked about to make this easy for everyone. Um, and if you have anything that you want to add, let me know. Um, so we talked about what candida is and it's a, did you say it acts like a parasite? So yes, it's a fungus, but it has to live off the human body. So it's parasitic. Okay. Um, so that's what it is. Um, it can cause most, it can be the cause of most ailments because it, of the yeah. way that it acts in your, in your gut. Yeah, the way it, the way it mimics other diseases like Lyme disease because it causes neuro stuff and it causes high histamine levels. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi doesn't cause a lot of histamine reactions. In fact, Borrelia burgdorferi suppresses your Th1, Th2 immunos, immune, immunos, immune cells in your gut. So you actually react to less. Right. Because it's trying to hide. Trying to hide. It's trying right. to keep it down. So yes. It causes um, interesting. And, you know, for anybody who needs an example of, of what we're talking about with histamine, the reason why antihistamines will make you drowsy is because of that thing where your brain is more energized by histamine. So yes. when your histamine is shut off in your brain, that's why you get sleepy. Right. Right. I just had a patient, sorry for the detour here, um, super, super, super histaminic. I've been trying for a long time to figure out what's in her environment causing her to have mast cell reactions like she's urticaric and she gets swollen lips and stuff um and i gave her the new mast cell stabilizer that we're using and it just knocked her out like i've never heard it made anybody this sleepy before and it's because her brain's been used to living on fire the whole time and we took the fire away and now wow. she's got some some relief even if i can't find out what's in the environment we can still stabilize mast cells and we can stop mast cell invasion, mast cell reactions, mast cell cytosis, you know, all those words that everybody loves to hear for our Lyme community. Yeah. I think we need to do, maybe the next episode should be a mast cell episode because we get a lot of questions on that too. Okay. Sounds so good. stay tuned. And I do know um, for everybody who has submitted a question, um, I see your questions and we are going to answer those um, definitely on the next episode. Um, I just wanted this one to be candida only so it's easy for everyone to search and find and just learn about candida. We have like 40 pending posts on the Facebook group. It's just like times have been a little bit crazy these days, so I can't get to all the questions. You can't either. Yeah, we're working on it. We're, we're coming back. So, you know, if you have questions, keep sending them. Um, we're getting back. We're getting the, the wheels rolling again. So we're getting on a better schedule with our recording and filming and doing all that stuff. Yes, I would like to just remind everyone, if you do have something that is an urgent matter, you nor I or anybody is monitoring the Facebook at all times. So if you send a message through the Facebook, you're probably not going to get an answer within a couple of days, at least. <laughs> so much for saying that because uh, I was looking at some things today that should definitely have not gone through. Um, a pending question on the Facebook group. Yeah. Or I've seen people who ask, you know, if, like, can I make an appointment on like the Facebook, like the chat or something? And like, I'm the only one that's going to see that. And I definitely can't help you make an appointment. So <laughs> you got to call. <laughs> but, um, you know, this was cool. I think that this will help, um, you know, open people's mind a little bit to thinking about candida. I don't think that people take candida very seriously and they kind of just shove it under the rug a little bit. And, you know, if you aren't fully taking, right, if you're not taking advantage of, um, you know, treating candida, you're never going to really heal to your full potential. It will be the nemesis underneath the scenes causing a lot of problems that you think are what you're treating, but it's maybe not. Maybe, maybe that doctor did help you cure your Lyme disease, but now you're left with candida from all the antibiotics and there you sit with some very similar symptoms. So it needs to be taken care of. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta seal those holes in the gut. Right. So, all right. Well, we're both losing our light here. So I'll let you go. 
Um, but this was a great episode. So thank you guys, everybody, for tuning in, and we will see you on the next one. Bye.